couple more weeks in Genesis 1, and then we'll get to Genesis 2, and then after Genesis 2, guess where we're going to be? You guys are good. You guys are good. I love you guys. So uh, Genesis 1 is where we're going to camp out. And speaking of birthdays, here's the weird thing. I know about 12 people that had the same birthday as me. Yeah, there's like 12 of us that know each other. And so every February 3rd, we blast off a little, happy birthday, everybody. So 48 years old, just in case you guys wanted to know, 48. So is that pretty good? Am I doing it right? Because I feel like I'm 26 inside. So that's good. But I probably look like I'm 62. So I don't know what that means, but turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter one, and it's good to be with you always. And um, I tell you what, here's here's the amazing thing: as you go to the Bible and you look at the days of creation, because that's what we're what we're in the middle of today. We're going to look at days four and five, um, and even part of six. It's amazing that God gives us a couple chapters on creation. If you think about how immense creation is, whether we're talking about the the world beyond us, or we're looking at the world within us, we are talking about incredible complexity. And yet God only gives a couple chapters to this because God wants us to know in the end that it is not necessarily what's important to know how these things came about. The question is, why did these things come about? And the why is answered in the rest of the Bible. See, Genesis 1 and 2 is the how, and lest we get so preoccupied or fixated on the how, we're going to miss the why. And the why is this, that God wanted to have a relationship with us. We have a God who is a creative God, who is a sovereign God, who is an imaginative God. I mean, think about what He has created But more than that, he is a relational God. And the why is because he wants to connect with us. That is awesome. And yet, these things that we see beyond us or within us are really pointers to his characters, to his nature, and even point to deeper spiritual realities that we're going to unpack a little bit this morning. But why are we here? People have been asked this question. Carl Sagan who is famous for Cosmo, uh, or Cosmos, the series, the book. Uh, He was interviewed by Ted Koppel about 20 years ago, and Carl Sagan was dealing with some health issues, and he's about ready to die. So here's Carl Sagan, an evolutionist. He is an astronomer. And Ted Koppel basically asked uh, Carl Sagan, Sir, do you have any words of wisdom for the people of the world? You've devoted your life to science, to evolution, to uh, astronomy. Do you have any words of wisdom for the world? Here's how Sagan responded. We live on a hunk of rock and metal that circles a humdrum star that is one of 400 plus billion other stars that make up the Milky Way galaxy, which is one of billions of other galaxies which make up a universe which may be one of a large number, perhaps an infinite number of other universes. That is well worth pondering. End quote. So you've devoted your whole life to something, and in the end, you give an absolutely empty and meaningless response to what can you pass on as far as a message to the people of the world. Albert Einstein got us a little bit closer. Einstein said this, of course there is a massive intelligence behind the universe. A man is a fool who doesn't believe that. But then he went on to say, but we could never know him. So Einstein acknowledges intelligence behind what has been created. But he comes up short saying, but yet the uncaused cause, this creator is unknowable. I'm going to move into the realm of C.S. Lewis yet again from his lecture called God in the Dock. Lewis says there are no accidents. Things don't happen by chance. 
We don't look around at the complexity of this world and the intelligence behind it because this is what the macro universe and the micro universe point to. Lewis said this. If the solar system was brought about by an accidental collision, then the appearance of organic life on this planet was also an accident, and the whole evolution of man was also an accident. If so, then all our present thoughts are accidents, the accidental byproduct of the movement of atoms. This holds for the thoughts of the materialists and astronomers as well as for everybody else. But if their thoughts are merely accidents, why should we believe any of them? I see no reason. That one accident should be able to give me a correct account of all other accidents? I disagree with. And then in his book, Miracles, he continues along the same vein. Each particular thought is valueless if it is the result of irrational causes. Obviously, then, the whole process of human thought, what we call reason, is equally valueless if it is the result of irrational causes. Hence, every theory of the universe which makes the human mind a result of irrational causes is inadmissible, for it would be a proof that there are no such things as proofs, which is nonsense. But evolution, it's commonly held, and is precisely a theory of this sort. Yet man and women, men and women throughout the ages have sought for things of meaning and value and significance. Why? Because there's something inherent within us as created creatures that says there's something more. Or else this is not even worth talking about. There are four conclusions. Honestly, if you, as you look at the world for the origin of the universe, one, either this is just an illusion, which I don't hold to, and if you hold to that view, don't lock your door tonight when you go to bed and we'll see how illusionary your life really is. Number two, it's self-created. Number three, it's self-existent and eternal. Matter has always existed. Or number four, which I believe is the only logical explanation, is that it was created by someone who is self-existent. And that's what we've been talking about for the past several weeks. And today and next week, we get to once again be in awe of the Creator who has designed us, our world, and everything we could possibly see with the human eye beyond us or within us. Today, day number four. Look at verse 14 of Genesis chapter one. This is where I, I love the, the topic of outer space. I've always been intrigued with uh, the stars and the constellations and galaxies. And I remember going up to Lowell Observatory with my family during the, the Pluto pictures that were sent back. And yes, I do believe Pluto is still a planet in my heart. I will never degrade Pluto, all right? So the New Horizons photos came back. We were there at Lowell Observatory the day the first pictures came across. And it was a party going on in Flagstaff, which there usually is, but this was the nerd type of party. So, um, And then, so we're up there and... We were up there at night. We went during the day, took a break, came back. And then there's this guy up at the Clark Telescope, which at that time was under renovation. He looks at Lori and I and goes, come here, come here. And we're like, so we're with our kids. We're like, okay. So he lets us in the Clark Telescope building, not open to the public. He goes, I want to show you guys something. And he lets us see through the Clark Telescope, and it's right on Saturn. And you could see the rings perfectly. And Lori, me, my kids were just like, I mean, we could see the moon, we could see the sun, but when you start seeing things like Saturn with its distinctive appearance, and you're looking at it with your own eye, there's something remarkable about that. And yet God just has it perfectly just out there to admire, to look at, to gaze at. And he's going to give us a chance to do that this morning. Look at for, verse 14. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day and to light to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and it was so. 
God made two great lights. The greater light to govern the day, which is called the sun, good, and the lesser light to govern the night, which is called the moon, and he made the stars also. And God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and morning the fourth day. First point, God is filling the heavens. Day one, two, and three, he's forming the world. He's forming the universe. He's forming the galaxies. Days four, five, and six, he's filling that which he has formed. So now we have this expanse we call the heavens or the sky. We looked at this last week. He separates the waters. He creates the the atmosphere, which is called the troposphere. He creates the waters below, and in between there's this thing called the sky. And from man's perspective now, we look up and we see these amazing creations out there. Genesis wants us to know that these are created by God. We call them the sun, we call it the moon, we call them the stars. And he has done these things so that these things give off light. But even more than that, as we're going to examine here in these few verses. So he fills the heavens, and we're going to call the sun, moon, and stars luminaries. And there's three functions of these luminaries. The first being this, he does it to give light. The luminaries give light. That is one of the kind of the no duh mo- moments of the morning, right? The sun gives life, light, and the moon also gives light. Though it's not a light in and of itself, it reflects the greater light of the sun, which reflects from it. And so here we are now in outer space. Now let's just stop and consider how vast this space is. Who knows with the speed of light how fast it travels? 186,000 miles a second. Speed of light travels, now write this down, 186,000 miles per second. How many, of that, how many miles does it travel in a year? Good question, here's the answer. Six trillion miles in a year. The speed of light will travel six trillion miles in one year. Did you know our Milky Way galaxy alone you have to travel 32,000 miles, 32,000 years before you even hit the center traveling at the speed of light. Six trillion miles a year, but it's going to take you 32,000 years just to get to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. We are one of 50 billion plus galaxies. We're just talking about our galaxy, folks. Like that big picture of space and there's that arrow on that little dot that says you are here. There's so much more out there. And by looking at so much space and thinking about so much of what's been created, it's amazing to consider the fact that why is God concerned about us? It makes you feel perhaps maybe insignificant. It definitely makes you feel small. It humbles you. But here we are in the midst of incredible creation. Astronomers are amazed by what's out there and i I love the question some people say well if there's not life on other planets or other life out there doesn't just seem like a waste of space i'm like god can do whatever he wants i can own a million acres of land and if i want to plant one little tiny lettuce leaf that's my choice right like god for some reason destined us on this rock third rock from the sun right to inhabit life And here we are. Johannes Kepler, founder of modern astronomy and the discoverer of the three planetary laws of motion, said this, the undevout astronomer is mad. Meaning the astronomer that looks, considers, examines, and is not moved inwardly in a spiritual sense is crazy. Isaac Newton said these words, the most beautiful system of the sun, the planets, the comets, could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. What we fail to recognize is that history is filled with men and women, astronomers, well-known folks that loved God, loved Jesus, 
The discoveries that we take for granted today were discovered by people who acknowledge a supreme and intelligent being who designed it all. And these are just testimonies of, of two that just tell us you cannot help but look and not be moved. Consider the three things. There's the sun. You ever consider how amazing the sun is? It is a huge star at the center of our solar system. So big that if you wanted to fill the sun with earths, you would need one million earths to fill the sun. It's made up of white hot hydrogen and helium glasses at the, uh, gases at this. I was sticking my glasses, so do I need to put those on? Can I look at the sun with my new glasses? Probably not a good idea, huh? Then I'd really be blind. So here it is filled with hydrogen, helium gla- uh, gases on the surface, 6,000 degrees Celsius at the core, 15 million degrees Celsius. 93 million miles from the earth, and yet the earth is able to have an average temperature range of 0 to 40 degrees Celsius, perfect for life to inhabit it. And if we were 5% closer to the sun, the oceans would boil and the water would all evaporate. And if we were 5% further, the oceans would freeze, perfectly suspended in space. But you think the sun's big? Well, there's a star out there called Antares, or Antares, so large it could swallow up the sun, 64 billion of our suns, to just to make up the size of that one star. You think that's big? Epsilon, so vast, its diameter is 3,000 times that of our sun, and its volume would require 27 billion times our sun. I sit there and I just go, at what point do you just not stop and just drop on the floor and go, wow. Consider the moon. We're going to call the moon the Earth's special little satellite. Ain't she cute? Why is the moon important? Because it orbits the Earth every 29 and a half days. Modern calendars are based upon it. Farmers depend upon it. They count the number of new moons because then they know how to, when the right time is to plant their crops. But the moon does not have light in and of itself. It only generates light because the true light comes from the sun, so it only reflects what the sun is giving it. And I don't know if this week you saw the trifecta of the, of the moon. I'm going to talk like a scientist now, but all I know is I got up at 6.20 in the morning because it was supposed to be my day to sleep in. Sleeping in my house is about 7 o'clock. So I got up at 6.20, walked outside my bathrobe, and I looked at the blood super moon blue, yeah, pirate ship, yeah, all that good stuff. So anyone else see it? See, I get a little bit more excited over the pictures people post. And I go, that's awesome. That's not what I saw, but that's awesome, right? Uh, Pretty incredible. But here we are admiring the sun and the moon. And then notice what else God created, stars. Now, here's the crazy thing. The Bible gives us five words. And the stars also were created. Done. You think about how many stars are out there? It It is innumerable. The number of stars in our, in our, in, in, that God's created. It's almost like, you know, the Bible says, and here's what God did with the stars, just kind of like, kind of like that dusting. Stars. Bigger than we could ever understand. And it reminds me of something because, again, the Bible is not meant to be an astronomical textbook. It gives us five words about the stars. Yeah, God created them. But the Bible is a textbook about redemption. And what we need to understand is that, yes, we have a God who creates, but more importantly, we have a God who suffers. And a suffering God who would devote 50 chapters to the building of the tabernacle and five words to the creation of the stars. What? does God want us to understand? 50 chapters on the tabernacle, the place where God says, I will meet with my people, Old Testament. 
This is of penultimate importance. Five words, and he created the stars also. While you imagine his creative ability, be in awe of the fact that he has suffered for us. So the luminaries give light. Number two, luminaries measure time. That's why the writer says, for days and for years. How do we measure the days? The rotation of the earth on its axis axis determines a 24-hour period. The rotation of the earth, uh, or the moon's orbit around the earth, determines a month. And it's the earth's rotation around the sun that determines the year. Isn't this cool how God has designed this? So there's days, and there's months, and there's years. Now notice, it's like, where do we get our weeks from? You know where we get our weeks from? Genesis chapter 1. Day 1, day 2, day 3, seven days. And God has created this in such perfect balance. It is truly amazing. Why is the moon important on the length of our days? Well, if you ever go to the ocean, you'll notice sometimes if you go to a beach, they'll have a sign that says, low tide, here's when it's going to happen. High tide, here's when it's going to happen. You know why the tides are important? Because the moon serves as putting the brakes on the spinning of the earth. You know how fast the earth spins on its axis? A thousand miles per hour. I kind of want to jump and get like totally swept away, but that's not how it all works. Because what the moon does is it puts the brakes on the earth by controlling the tides in which the oceans, two-thirds of our planet, keep the earth spinning on its axis. Now what prevents us from flying off? Like on those school playground things, right? And you're just like, ah! And you like go and you go flying into the wood chips. What, what prevents that from happening? The sun. The sun's gravitational pull so works with the moon so that while we're spending a thousand miles per hour on its axis and now a thousand miles per hour in our orbit, which is co- it's going to cover fi- 500 million miles in that orbit, you and I are perfectly content just to stand here and not worry about it. And we just want to say it's all an accident. So the length of the day is determined by the rotation of the earth. The length of the year is determined by the orbit of the earth around the sun. Pretty amazing. What about the luminaries marking important events? They mark events for signs and seasons. Notice what it says there in Genesis. He creates these luminaries. He says they're good for days and years, for giving light. But don't miss the signs and seasons. First, the seasons. The sun helps us in rejuvenating life on planet earth, the growing of crops, the flourishing of earth, the blessing of mankind, all because the earth is tilting on its axis and it's perfect to grow the crops needed for seasons. The moon determines the month. And again, like I said, the farmers out there are able to predict when the new moon happens, plant crops, don't plant crops. It's pretty amazing. We take seasons seasons for granted, right? I hear there's four seasons in the world. I know of two seasons living in Arizona, amen? But four seasons where things are birthed, things die, and the earth just goes through the cycle of recreating itself with a sovereign creator behind it all. What about for signs? Think about this. For signs, what kind of signs do the luminaries give us? Well, Think about the fact that before there were maps, explorers followed the stars. They looked at the constellations. They considered the the stars, the Big Dipper, you know, Orion's Belt, things like that. They they were were of navigational importance. I love that. uh, Antiques Roadshow. I'm kind of a nerd like that. I'm always amazed at what some things are worth. I'm like, God, I just threw that out the other day. Darn, I could be a millionaire. But some guy came in with a a globe it was a little tiny globe literally about this size so it was this globe had the entire you know then known continents this thing's about 400 years old little globe then known world kind of painted on it well what's amazing it had this little latch and they opened it and on the inside was a perfect reflection of all the constellations this thing was like worth fifty thousand dollars But what it was, it was a globe that would these sailors would use to navigate the oceans. And they used the inside as kind of a map and compass. And I just thought to myself, that's incredible. 
So for navigational purposes, signs, yes, important. Consider the religious observances for the Jewish people, knowing when certain seasons happen, tied in with their religious practices. What about Jesus' words? You know, Luke chapter 21, he says, you'll know the end when certain things happen in the heavens. Right? The, the sun uh, will disappear and the moon will become like blood red. And so even Jesus said, consider what you see as signs of, impen- of, the, of the end. They also display the glory of God, right? Perhaps one of the greatest signs is Psalm 19. You know, the heavens declare of your glory. The, the stars speak of how amazing you are. Now, some take it too far. And, uh, you know, it's, people love horoscopes, right? This is not how the, the luminaries are to be used, okay? If you're into horoscopes, do they still do the horoscopes? And, you know, I, I love it because just this week someone posted a, a meme that I love and I, I, wa- I wanted to save it and share it with you this morning. So horoscopes are kind of like fortune cookies, right? And I love this fortune that someone, someone opened the fortune cookie and here's what the fortune said. You will continue to interpret vague statements as uniquely meaningful. <laughs> this goes in line with with horoscopes right like people are so like into the stars like what sign are you like you know i'm aquarius and they're like oh, your day is destined for greatness and i sit there and go i would know that without the horoscope thank you very much because i'm loved by jesus amen right they're so generally vague that people just grab onto these things and they live their lives for- this is not the purpose of the luminaries You are not to bank your life off your astrological forecast. You are to bank your life on what God has given to you in His revealed written Word. There's no place for astrology and horoscopes and fortune cookies. There's a place for the Word of God to act as a sign to direct your path. And if you're into horoscopes, it's not the unforgivable sin, okay? So just forgive yourself right now, this morning. And just say, no, I'll pursue truth through the, through the wor- word, not the horoscopes. And yet people bank their lives on the zodiac. What, 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 what are we to take from all this? Can I just close this section with a few couple psalms? Psalm 8. I love Psalm 8. The psalmist says in verse 3, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers. Now, just tell me, stop right there. I love how the psalmist basically says, just so you know, here's what God did with the heavens. Just your your fingers. If he does that with his fingers, what could he do with his arm? The moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? human beings that you care for them can i can i just stop us and just once again acknowledge the fact that while what has been created out there is amazing and awe inspiring consider the greater reality that god is mindful of us and cares for us that's why later on the psalmist in psalm 136 sings this is a song To him who made the heavens with skill, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the great lights, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The sun to rule by day, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The moon and the stars to rule by night, for his loving kindness is everlasting. You see the refrain that keeps repeating? His loving kindness is forever consider what he's created but be mindful of who you are who have been created in his image so he fills the heavens with the luminaries what does he do next actually before we move on one last application out of this section because here's the tough part right being a pastor preacher speaker if you want to call me reverend go for it uh reverend that's so is that baptist ryan tell me okay you hang out with that crowd so all right i mentioned this earlier here here's a closing application for us the people of god 
The sun gives this light. The moon reflects the sun's light. Perhaps our application at this point is this. The son of righteousness, according to Malachi, is Jesus. We as his people do not have a light in and of ourselves, but we've received a great light from him. Perhaps our role is like that of the moon, where light does not originate for us. It is a reflection of a greater light we claim to know and have received. We live in a world that is dark spiritually. And maybe we should start heeding the counsel and words of God where he says, you are the light set upon a hill. Reflect my light, my love, my grace to a world that's dark. Because he is the light of the world. But we are the ones who are to walk in that light and to reflect that light. And perhaps in our walk with him, the lives of the people in our lives are better because we're reflecting the light and love of Jesus. Amen? That's how you pull personal application out of Genesis 1, right? It's like, what what does God want us to understand? Well, there's a reason why he alludes to these great lights. There's a spiritual reality that's more important. Number two, he's going to fill the waters and the skies. So he's filling day four, the heavens, with his luminaries, Now we're going to get down to planet Earth. And can I tell you, I'm a sucker for nature shows. We watched Born in China the other day. Just loved it. Like, I think I love it more than my kids. I laugh and I giggle and, you know, there's the the panda. Who saw Born in China? Anyone? Shame on you sinners. You guys need, need to watch these. So there's this panda, right? They're filming the panda. And the panda has to eat. 50 pounds of bamboo a day to survive. I mean, I'm up to 20, but I I have nothing to compete with that panda. But I'm sitting there looking at creation, and usually when we watch shows and there's underwater creatures, especially fish, I sit there and go, mmm, you know, through the whole show. My kids are like, Dad, that's sick. I'm like, hey, it's good. You know, so I'm not talking about food that we eat or don't eat. I'm not going to talk about that today. But we're going to talk about how God fills the waters and the skies with two types of creatures, fish and fowl. So write those two words down. Fish and fowl. Look at verse 20. God says, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. Circle the word living because this is the first mention of this very unique term that literally means soul. He has yet to create something with a soul. So now he creates living creatures. He says, let the birds fly above the earth in the open expanse called the heavens. Isn't that cool? God creates the oceans to be filled with living creatures. He creates the the sky, this open expanse to be filled with creatures, fish and fowl. And God created the great sea monsters. And every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them. Circle the word bless. First appearance of the word bless. What does bless mean? We're going to talk about that here in a minute. And he says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. So day number five. This is where BBC gets excited because they're like, oh, we get to film all the underwater stuff and all the stuff in the sky. I remember being blown away by a show uh, years ago called Winged Migration. If you ever get a chance to watch Winged Migration, there's a guy on an ultralight plane filming all sorts of migratory paths of birds and you would think totally boring and it's yet exciting because they trace these things here's the thing about fish and fowl these two distinct creatures because they live in two distinct environments what you need to consider is this both have streamlined design forms to enable them to move swiftly through their native habitats Think about this. Fish and fowl. Streamlined and able to navigate the water and the air. Both are covered with shingle-like layers of protective fins or feathers. Both have hollow, lighter bones which allow them to navigate at the speeds they do. Both lay eggs and both have migratory instincts. Day five, God says, I'm going to create these things. And they're going to reproduce after their kind. 
Next week, we're going to talk about how incredibly coded DNA is in order to produce all the various kinds within the single kind that we're talking about today. If you go online and you, and you type in, you know, you know these, these different kinds of dogs, you know, God created the dog, but within the structure of the DNA within that dog, it is coded for it to have a myriad of variations. Thank God all dogs are not like chihuahuas. Amen? Those are really rats. In the, I mean, really, let's be honest. So if, you, if you're a small dog person, I'm sorry. I like big dogs. The kinds you can kind of ride around the house. You know what I'm talking about? Those are the kind of dogs. But he has created such complexity within every single animal he's created. Now, after its kind is important because it doesn't mean dogs are going to become seagulls. Like some evolutionary thinking would have us believe, and there's no record of it in any sort of transitional fossil record, he has incredibly given each kind variation within its own makeup. So you have fish and you have fowl. Isn't it amazing day five God creates these creatures to inhabit environments that man longs to be in, but we are not wired to live in those environments? How long have, has man, has woman longed to venture into the oceans, but you can only survive in the ocean for so long? I mean, given my way, because I'm Aquarius, just so you guys know, my, my sign is Aquarius. I love the water, right? We go to the beach. I'm like the biggest kid out there splashing around in the water like, hey, boogie board forever, right? So that's me. But I'm not designed to live in the water. Yet mankind has longed to explore and examine and live, but yet you're not designed that way. Think about the sky. How long man has longed to, to exist and live like the, the birds that fly above us. I mean, this is the tale of Icarus, right? Who was so boastful, so prideful, said, I will create wings and fly to the sun. And he builds the wings out of wax, flies towards the sun, and the, as close as he's able to get, the wings eventually melt and he falls back to earth. And yet it has been man's desire to go to these places that are alien environments to us, but yet natural habitats for what God has created. So here we are, looking at fish, looking at fowl, and I want you to consider two important points. With this day of creation, God creates conscious life, and he creates reproductive life. And I'm excited to talk about reproduction with you guys. <laughs> just kidding. But I am. But I'm, I'm just kidding too. So conscious life first. Living creatures. Creatures that are self-aware. This is what we mean by consciousness. Consciousness involves rationality. Consciousness involves emotions. Consciousness involves decisions, volition. These are the three things that comprise a self-aware creature. The ability to decide, the ability to feel, and the ability to think. And so God creates these living creatures with soulish capabilities. Now I'm going to tell you what makes the animal world distinct from the plant world is this point. Because God has already created the vegetation and the plants and the trees, but now he creates living, soulish creatures. But he has yet to create the greatest creature, humans, and the very thing that makes us distinct as soulish creatures from the, the living creatures is this, God consciousness. And we're going to unpack this in the weeks to come. See, animals feel. Animals feel the, 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 the blessing of the presence of man. Animals feel the, sin, the human sin that man can sometimes exhibit. Think about man's best friend, the dog, right? A dog will behave according to how its master treats it. Dogs think... Dogs decide, dogs feel. I mean, we have a dog, a rot rescue in our house named Ellie. She's about 50, 40, 50 pounds, right? She knows who the master is in her house. Because I beat her. No, I don't. I don't. 
But there is something within her instinctual nature. When I'm home, she knows who the boss is. Example, I'll come home and Lori will be like, she's, you know, she's watching Victoria right now with my daughter, right? So go PBS. All right, so she's watching. And the rule is Ellie is not to be on our bed. As soon as Ellie hears me come up the stairs, Ellie gets up and gets off the bed. <laughs> she knows. But she is such a loving dog. And yet there's people that raise dogs in environments that aren't loving. And we know this because they tend to growl, they tend to bark, they tend to, to bite. Now that's all because of the environment they were raised in. And so animals have an, a, an amazing ability to connect with humans. There are relationship bonds that are formed between the animal world and, and humans, but the thing that makes us distinct is that we alone have a God consciousness that we're going to talk about next week. So, here are the animals created with these soulish qualities. You can also write down uh, next to soul in your notes that having soulish qualities really are the things that give us passions and appetites, desires. And so, because these things have instinctually these desires to eat and to reproduce, these are all good things that God has created within this creation. And so, we have the creation of conscious life, but we also have the creation of reproductive life. Now, this is what's awesome and epic, and I love the Word of God for this reason, is we look at the word blessed, and I think it's in verse 22. God bless them. First time we see God blessing something, and here it is. What does bless mean in this context? It is the ability to have sex. At the heart of what God is doing here, He's not only created creatures with soulish qualities, He has blessed them because notice what He says right after He blesses them. Go, multiply, and fill the earth. Now the animal kingdom does this because they're designed to do this. What sets us apart is that now there are passions and there are desires within us when it comes to our sexuality that God says, this idea of reproducing is a blessing, but you need to know that with these passions come choices and you are uniquely designed and that you can choose wrongly when it comes to sexuality. And we're not going to talk about the, the wide swath of topics that fit under this topic today, but we're going to deal with this here in a couple weeks. But notice how the word blessed is connected with reproduction. And isn't this amazing? If you stop and even consider reproduction and what happens in reproduction among animals, among humans, it is an incredibly complex thing that produces such glorious life. And you can't help but stop and go, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for creating the world in which we are able to multiply and fill the earth there's qualities of pleasure there's qualities of choice for us as humans and yet the animal world i mean who doesn't get excited over the birth of a little baby puppy i talk about puppies a lot because i don't talk about cats cats are off limit in my world i still hold something against god for creating cats but that's that's personal stuff i have to struggle with i'm sorry but god has created all these things so that he may be glorified now let's just stop and go why is looking at what god fills the oceans with and what he fills the, the skies with. Think about the, the importance of, of marine life, which is plentiful in the ministry of Jesus. Remember when Jesus said, Peter, go, go get me a coin. Pulls up a fish. Pulls out a coin, right? Whose image do you see? Jesus used this as an object lesson. And he says... Caesar's image is on this coin. Jesus says famously, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But then he says to Peter, but you render to God what belongs to God. Why is this significant? Because a coin has an image stamped on it. Your life has an image stamped on it. 
you live your life according to the image that you bear. And if you're created in the image of God, you live your life in a way that reflects His glory and His goodness. That's an important lesson. Think about the fish that He multiplied to feed 15,000 people. Now that's quite a party. I mean, I don't know companies that cater that large a group, but Jesus can do it! Because He takes the loaves and the fish from the little boy and He multiplies it. What God is able to do with what He has created is amazing. Think about, back to the care and concern, What did Jesus say in Mark 10? He said, if one sparrow falls to the ground, I, God, am aware of it. How much more do you think I care for you? I mean, think about that. If God is aware of every single bird that falls from the sky, how much more is he aware of you who are created in his image? Thank you, God, for creating these things to point to not only your incredible ability to create with such complexity and design, but that these things point to greater truths about how you love us. Amen? Last point, and we're going to dovetail this into next week. He fills the land. So he fills the heavens. He fills the waters and the skies, fish and, and fowl. And now he fills the land. Verse 24, And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, beasts of the earth after their kind, and was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, everything that creeps on. So notice, after its kind is important. Totally debunks evolution. Everything is created according to what is wired and the information encoded within it is to create. And yet now God creates three types of groups here. Write these down. There's domestic animals, there's wild animals, and there's crawling animals. Ooh, who hates crawling animals? Ah, Yeah, crazy. So there's domestic animals, things like cows and horses and things that man is able to domesticate. There are wild animals, things that man has yet to domesticate, right? Or tries to, you know, things like lions and elephants, you know, wild, big, large mammals and beasts. And then there's also the crawling things. I like how Genesis says creeping. Yeah, they're creepy, aren't they? Things that are close to the ground and, and crawl and have small legs and small rats and rodents and things like that. All included here. And this is probably where dinosaurs fit in. And I'm not going to speak about dinosaurs, but talk about the large monsters in the water and talks about these beasts on earth. And, you know, the Bible obviously gives us just enough information, but it doesn't totally spell it out for us. This is not a hill we're going to die on. Amen. Where dinosaurs existed in this whole thing. But all we know is after the flood that Noah encountered, he saved his family. There's no record there's no indication of dinosaurs if anything they died before the flood conditions and this is probably where they fit into the grand narrative of things but notice what's missing here in this part of the wild animals and the and the beast and the cattle the absence of the blessing on the land animals he blesses the waters and the skies but he doesn't bless the land animals notice it's absent And it's not that they don't have reproductive capabilities. The idea is that what man now is going to do with land animals, because guess who else is going to occupy the land? Us. And we have now a role to have dominion over the beast of the land. One of man's roles is not only to multiply and fill the earth, but to have dominion over the... The one place we don't have dominion over are the oceans and the skies. These are things that they have their own dominion over, the fish and the fowl. But over land, we will now occupy the same space with these creatures. God, there's an absence of blessing here. Why? Because we have a responsibility to have dominion over the land creatures. What that looks like and what our role is and what we are to be as human beings is going to come up in the next couple weeks. We'll stop right there. May God bless the reading of his word. May God apply his truth to our hearts. What a fun thing to do. I kind of feel like a a science teacher on Sunday mornings now. But this is good. God is awesome, is he not? Let's stand, let's pray. 
And I want to close with really the words of Psalm 8. Father, we are humbled as we consider the world above us. We are humbled as we consider the world around us. And yet as we consider these things, Father, we can't help but ask the question, why are you mindful of us? And why do you care for us? Well, for most of us, we know that you're God who chose to suffer in order to have relationship with us. Unlike any other relationship you have with creatures in this world, you want to love man and woman and to have a relationship with us, and we are blown away by that. Help us to live in that reality. Lord, as unloved as we may feel because of shame and guilt, Allow us to be freed, to be loved as we are, to be known as we are, to be accepted as we are, because you, God, have created us to have relationship with us. What is man that you are mindful of him? What is man that we should even be cared for by you? Well, obviously, we are the apex of creation. We are the apple of your eye. Help us to live in that truth as we consider these incredible points of of days of creation. Lord, what's magnificent is they all point to how awesome and glorious and grand you are. Lord, thanks for loving us in Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Have a great day, guys. Go Eagles!